welcome back to Who's in Your Cloud, 21 Steps to Secure, Reliable, and Trusted Technology. I'm Lauren Love, Marketing Manager for Tech on Purpose and the host of your show. And this is episode 11, Data Encryption. Before we get into it, catch up on all of our episodes of our top Cyber One security practices on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, or Spotify, and visit techonpurpose.net slash blog to sign up to get episodes delivered straight to your inbox. In today's global economy, the need for data encryption should be obvious by now, but how does that happen? Where does it happen? And whose job is it anyways to encrypt? Today, we'll be discussing how you can use data encryption to deter malicious actors from accessing and using sensitive data as we take a closer look at Top Cyber 21 Best Practice number 11. As you may have noticed by now, we're missing someone today. Who's in your cloud creator, Matt Tangersley, isn't able to join us, but that's okay because the star of the show, yours truly, is here today, and the show must go on. So with that, we also have an all-star cast on deck to talk all things data encryption. Um, so let's meet our gang. Since I'm flying solo, I am very happy to welcome back two blog veterans, our VIP cast member, Jay Ryersey from ConnectWise, and Jeremy Sadler from CyberTrust Alliance. Since I'm carrying the team here, I'm so thankful for both of you coming back. And we're excited to be here. So Lauren, thanks. And to the rest of the, the, the gang, welcome. All right. And new to the vlog, and I'm finally happy to have a girl. I think we've only had two girls on the vlog so far, and we're already halfway through. But we have Dina Bachman from App River. And then another new member we have is Patrick Noe from Global Sign. We are excited to introduce both of you guys to the vlog. And very welcome to be here. Looking awesome. forward to it. Yeah, of course. Thank hopefully, you having... hopefully you guys have enough fun and come back next time like uh, Jay and Jeremy. Security experts projected that 2014 was going to be the year of encryption. But here we are almost a decade later. In fact, it's eight years later. Um, and it's reported that no more than 4% of breach data is protected by encryption. So the primary problem seems to be a lack of overall understanding. So one of the biggest misconceptions is that people tend to think, including myself, that data encryption is only for government or military or unless it's legally required in their industry. But I've learned as a rule of thumb, if you have sensitive data, which could be anything about your products, operations, customers, or employees, then you should always encrypt. Today, we'll be learning that numerous factors go into it, including things like what should be encrypted? Is my data at rest or in transit? And what does that even mean? Our goal today is that our viewers will know more and have the knowledge, tools, and partners necessary to ensure all of their data is encrypted all of the time. So we are fortunate to have a comprehensive team of cyber experts because my knowledge is where it ends, right about here. So let's meet our cast. Jay, we'll start with you. Tell us about yourself and your role at ConnectWise. Sure, and thanks again, Lauren. So I am Jay Ryersey. I'm VP of Global Security Sales. Uh, I, I bring a, a unique um, perspective of the conversation because while I, I own a sales team, uh, I'm a CISSP. I ran a managed service business very similar to Tech on Purpose, where we supported you know hundreds of, of businesses you know, around the world ultimately, but we had clients in 35 states. And so encryption is a fantastic topic. It's, it's one that starts sadly on the wrong side of the, of the tracks, right? You know, I think back in 2015, the only people that got the message about the value of encryption were the bad guys. And, and we've been suffering through ransomware ever since, right? Now it started before then, but that's when we really started to see it take hold in, in the um, in, in that, that small and medium business space um, at meaningful levels, obviously over the last you know, five to six years, it's, it's become a major concern. Right. But now let's reverse this conversation, right? And jump to the right side of the track. So we're on the good guy's side. So you mentioned the, the, the need to think about encryption, you know, data at rest and data in motion. 
Right. There's also data in processing, which is actually one more layer that we have to think about, but it's probably, um, we could spend all day on just that topic, right? You know, um, how do you do it? What's the right way? How does it work? Where do certificates fit in? And those kinds of things. So one of the topics that I hope we cover today, and I'm pretty sure that uh, Patrick might be our expert on this, though, who knows, Jeremy and Dana might surprise me, is managing encryption keys. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's worse than losing your car keys. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that we understand that and that we're, we're covering that today for, for everybody to, to clearly understand the impact of encryption. So... With that, back to you. Awesome, thank you. So Dina, you're up first as my lady on the cast. So okay. introduce yourself and App River. Okay, so um, I'm Dina Bachman. I'm VP of Product Management um, for Zix App River. Um, and um, our you know, focus is around email. So one of our products is email encryption. And, um, and so it is very much, uh, something that we see is, as you said earlier, Lauren, people don't really understand why they need it. And we see that every day. Um, and it's interesting because especially in the world of email, people don't realize a, a standard email when sent is really like a postcard. Mm -hmm. There is nothing by default that protects the data in that email. And so, you know, if you're not doing something to, to put encryption around that email communication, you know, you might as well just put all your information <laughs> out on the internet because every email goes over the internet. And if it's not protected, it's just, it's out there. Absolutely. And it's very easy for hackers to get to. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And how often do we just send an email and rattle off something super important and not thinking of encryption. I mean, I know until you just said that, I wouldn't even thought about that. Yeah. And the industry has tried to really, you know, up its game um, with standards that uh, try and encrypt as much of the email traffic as possible. But we constantly see um, that, you know, people, when they patch their systems or change their configuration and servers, they mess it up. Um, and so uh, one of the great things you can even uh, look at is Google has what they call their transparency report. They actually track, mm -hmm. Google tries very hard to always use encryption and they track how often they can't get encryption. Um, and they do pretty good. Google you know, tries to be very secure, but it's about between 84 and 86% of mm -hmm. the time they can get encrypt, uh, encryption which again, it's, it's pretty good. But if you're dealing with really sensitive information, it's right. not good <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Okay, so we're happy to learn more from you about that in a round table topic number one. So yeah, okay. we'll be back to you. Okay. Awesome, awesome. Okay, perfect. Um, let's see, Patrick, tell us more about your background and introduce Global Sign. You guys are here for the first time. Uh, yes, thanks for having us. Uh, Global Sign is a globally trusted certificate authority and trust services provider. Uh, we deal a lot with certificates uh, that handle authentication. Um, more of the encryption that we're dealing with uh, is at data in transit, but at the same time, um, you know, we've got some other uh, offshoots that, that handle other, other areas of encryption as well. Um, you know, kind of to Jay's point, I, I completely agree. I think key management has been one of the biggest obstacles that uh, a lot of organizations are facing, especially as things scale and they're seeing more and more certificates and keys be used. And, you know, I think that's a great topic to get into because if you don't have adequate protections in place and an employee moves on or some emergency occurs where you lose key material, you know, or you lose those keys, excuse me. Uh, you're out all of that information. Anything that it is encrypted is now very, very difficult for you to recover without going through some extraordinary means. So I think that's a really important topic for us to lean on. But just in general, the management of certificates and keys, um, you know, over the course of the last couple of years, as there's been a rush to work in more remote situations because of the pandemic and everything going on, and we're seeing, you know, people access networks from outside of the office more frequently. Um, we're seeing a lot of mixed environments now. Uh, that's really opening a lot of organizations up to, uh, you know, potential vulnerability as well. And I think that's something that needs to be addressed and rectified very quickly here because, you know, I'm not sure we're going to be getting back to the office anytime soon. Yeah. And 
as you're working on closing those attack vectors, you're leaving yourself open to, you know, something potentially very bad happening. Okay, so if I'm hearing you correctly, I shouldn't have an encryption key printed and on my desk, right? <laughs> Definitely <laughs> well, not. Kind of prohibitive to print a good encryption key, but yes, I, ideally that would not be a good way yeah. for you to store it. Matt would be very upset with me for sure. All right, Jeremy, round us out. Thank you, Lauren. So my name is Jeremy Sadler. I am the Information Security Officer at CyberCoast Alliance. Um, my primary role and in, in, in day to day activity is, is providing compliance guidance uh, through primarily risk assessment services and risk analysis uh, for both regulated and unregulated industries. Um, you know, everything from NIST and SANS related unregulated audits to HIPAA or PCI related audits and assessments. Um, you know, I love the topic of encryption because it helps me to explain tangibly to a business owner or organization where their sensitive data is and how they should be encrypting and protecting that information uh, to, you know, to, to rehash some of the topics we've already introduced, right? Both in transit, at rest. Uh, I love that Dina mentioned email encryption. That's a, a big topic that a lot of people overlook. Um, and then an, uh, related to that, also looking at the way encryption can not only protect our information from being exposed electronically in transit as we would an email message or even our SSL web traffic over the web, but also how encryption can provide non-repudiation, right? Proof uh, or evidence through digital signatures and signage of either emails or other things to validate that a message did in fact come from the, the person or entity you believe it did, right? So a lot of great uses to, to encryption and, and how we leverage it to protect our data and prove the authenticity of our data or our information and where it's coming from, where it's going to. I'm super excited to be here today to discuss those and other topics. Yeah, we're excited for you to join us. All right, Mr. Ryersey, as our VIP cast member, I want you to start us off. So for our first roundtable topic, how do we categorize the types of data that needs to be encrypted and then explain further on why it's important and why someone like me should care. Um, and of course, any scary facts, statistics, horror stories that you have. Yeah, if you've heard before, I have a tendency to sometimes go too dark, too fast. So I apologize, but I won't as much here today because I think I've already gone there with mm -hmm. the ransomware side of encryption. So, <laughs> so our team spent a lot of time working with partners on encryption at the endpoint level. Right, so think about the, the devices that are, are relevant and, and what that's gonna look like for you. And we don't necessarily do encryption, we don't have a product for encryption, but we work with our partners to think about, uh, okay, what's built into native uh, Microsoft Windows operating system? What comes with a Mac? You know, you can start with some very basic um, disk encryption there, which is gonna protect your data at rest in most cases. Um, if, if you're in healthcare, if you're in a heavily regulated industry, you know, you're going to have to have encryption turned on on these devices. In that scenario, it's easy to do as long as you've got a good key management system. Like you have a process you're going to use to manage those keys. And today it's much, much easier than it was even two or three years ago. So, you know, working with tech on purpose and with other companies, you, you can quickly determine how you're going to manage that. But think about it as, hey, if, if, if I want to identify the data in my network, that's most important to me. It's your financial records, it's, it's business plans, it's stock information, stockholder information, it's client information. And like the, encrypting that's gonna be far more important to me than you know, encrypting you know, a five-year-old sales quote that, that was rejected and never used. I mean, you probably has value on there and, and things are trying to protect like you know, personally identifiable information or your client information might be there, but mm -hmm. it's gonna be a little less important than your most important data. Right. The other thing that we think about and talk about with, with partners on a regular basis is, you know, it used to be where all the data was on a server in a closet in the back. Well, now we know it's everywhere. I mean, the data truly is in the cloud and, and you've got to understand what the encryption policies and guidelines are for all of your data storage locations. So a, a great question to ask this group because I don't even know if I know the answer today is you know, how does Microsoft encrypt our data? What does it require to do that there? What is Google doing for us? What is QuickBooks doing for us? What is uh, Peachtree Software, whoever you're using today, your, your electronic medical records company, all these 
all these places where we're putting data and we're trusting that they're backing it up and it's encrypted, right? We've had that conversation of backups before and making sure that it's meeting the requirements that you have for your regulations that you're trying to meet, what your legal responsibilities are. And then understanding what type of encryption they're, they're doing because we haven't even got into you know, mm-hmm. the, the different types of encryption. And again, I'm going to let Jeremy own that if he wants to, because we could spend all day just covering, you know, how you encrypt and what that looks like. So I'm thinking about the easy stuff for most business owners that, that are listening in today and business leaders, you know, encrypt that data that's at rest, the stuff that you have control over, the stuff that you can reach out and get to quickly. So on your servers, in your office, in your, on your workstations, um, on your mobile devices, you know, make sure that, that, that your users have encryption turned on and it's not difficult and it's typically not expensive, but it does require a strategy and, and a plan to implement and probably company policy that you're going to follow and make sure that, that the, the colleagues, you know, mm-hmm. align to it and understand the importance of it. Right, exactly. So Jay's coming from my job. So Jeremy, he set you up perfectly um what does our audience need to know about data encryption from you and can you touch base a little bit on compliance absolutely so uh, you know one of the things i i think i want to start i want to lead off with along the compliance side of things is for business owners to understand that whether they have a regulatory obligation to encrypt a particular type of data like health data or whether they have just sensitive business data whether it be competitor data intellectual property data or sensitive financial data To each individual business, that information can be equally valuable as a different data type is to a different entity. The importance is to protect that data, right? And that's what encryption does. You think about, and I actually want to cue off of something else Jay mentioned. uh, As he started off, he, he mentioned it getting dark in the ransomware segment. You think about what ransomware does to our data. What does it do? It encrypts it, right? That's how it leverages the ransom against us by encrypting and making our data unavailable to us. If we can leverage that same tool of encryption to make it unreadable by the threat actors and unrecoverable by unauthorized people, we then turn the whole thing on its head, right? And take advantage of the same technology they're using against us, right? And that's the intent. So a great example, as Jay mentioned, you know, laptops or even servers for that matter, right? And, And an encryption at rest. You look at something like breach of protected health information. I don't care if you lose a laptop or a server that has a million patient records on it. If you can prove effectively that device was encrypted at rest, it does not constitute a material breach of that information, yeah. right? So that's where, of course, effective key management comes into play because the intention of proving that encryption is in place is that you can prove beyond reasonable doubt that that data could not be recovered by unauthorized individuals. Mm -hmm. The only way that's going to be true is that it was encrypted and then you've got good secure key management, right? right? In other words, not only is it encrypted, but the recovery key for that encryption isn't, you know, tattooed on the backside of the device or whatever the case might be. Yeah, exactly. Um, Right, so that's exactly where we come in with with encryption under under a compliance perspective, right? Is is we look at the ways to protect our data and our regulatory obligation to protect that data, even if we get breached. How can we prevent it from being recovered or read by or observed by unauthorized All right. individuals? All right, thanks, Jeremy. Dina, we're going to turn it over to you. The floor is all of yours. Talk about yeah. data encryption in general, and can you speak more to specifics on email encryption? I know we touched on it before, but go more yeah. in depth. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, email encryption, I think we've kind of hit on this uh, a number of times. It is very important. It is really important if you are an organization that um, is under certain regulations like HIPAA or Graham Leach Bliley. Um, or even if you're not under regulations, but you're worried about you know, your reputation as a company if you're handling sensitive data for your customers. Um, now, specifically in the area of, of email, one of the issues with email communication, if you think of your day-to-day work life, you probably use email a lot. And when you jump into an email, you're not stopping to think about oh, let me think about each piece of information I'm putting in here. You're trying to get your job done, okay? You're trying to send some information to somebody else so they can do their job. And so what we find a lot with email is that because it's that quick, you know, I'm just going to send this real quick. I'm going to get it done. 
people don't stop and think about what they're sending. And as I talked about before, um, in fact, somebody asked about Google and Microsoft. I think, Jay, that was you. Google and Microsoft do a really good job. When the data, when the emails are in their system, they do a good job of encrypting that data and protecting it. But every email you send is going to go over the internet. And it's over that internet where it's very easy for hackers to kind of uh, look at the traffic and you know, see what's being sent. And so that's, that's where we really see the biggest need um, for encryption. And uh, we also kind of you know, touched on the certificate management. That's always what's made email encryption the hardest is how do you manage keys and manage the certificates with all the people you wanna send emails to? And um, so, you know, for, for years and years, that's what kind of helped people up from even doing anything about uh, encrypting that data. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's a, a huge area, one that's um, incredibly important to, to think about. Um, and obviously, if you're in a regulated industry, you definitely need to think about it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dina. Patrick, over to you. Why should our audience care about data encryption? And what more do we need to know about digital certificates? Uh, well, to touch on something that uh, Dana just said uh, regarding SMIME certificates, which are email security certificates, and the difficulty in historically being able to you know, get them out across your organization to all the endpoints that would need them. That's really something that over the past few years through various automation tools and management tools, we've been over to really able to overcome. So that's no longer an obstacle. And frankly, I think it's important that most organizations understand that that barrier no longer exists and that they should be using email security certificates. But that sort of speaks to a larger trend we're seeing, which is that the volume of certificates being used, um, and it might help for me to really quickly explain what a certificate is used for. Um, you know, there's various types of certificates that serve various types of functions, whether that's creating digitally secure cryptographic signatures, um, whether that's securing emails through signatures and encryption, uh, whether that's securing web traffic with SSL. Um, there's a number of different use cases for different types of certificates and organizations, especially enterprises, are using more and more now than ever before. So really, as you're starting to use more certificates, that means you're managing more certificates and not only just having the proper tools to manage all the certificates and keys uh, become so important, but so does automating a lot of those more tedious functions so that you can continue to turn over certificates and renew them when they need to be renewed or revoke them when they need to be revoked. If you don't have the capability of doing that at scale, you're really going to be putting your IT and security teams in kind of a hole because they're going to be doing so much work just to maintain your own PKI, uh, which is public key infrastructure, which is a huge mechanism of encryption. Um, that they're going to have a hard time focusing on really anything else. So as you are looking at encrypting, uh, understand that that's going to require the usage of a large number of certificates, and that's going to require mechanisms to both manage those certificates and also handle some of the more tedious functions through automation. We are going to move into our second roundtable topic today. And ladies first, we're going to have Dina chime in. So Let's hear about your company's specific solution to data encryption. Sure. So um, obviously, because I've been talking about email encryption uh, throughout this, um, that is what we provide. We provide a hosted email encryption service. Um, it, it basically will work with any email system. Uh, a lot of our customers today have gone to either Office 365 right. or, or Google. And so uh, those are primarily what we uh, support. Um, but what we do is customers basically route their email traffic through us. And we don't actually just do email encryption. We also do email DLP. So we will scan the email, determine if there's sensitive data in it. And then if there is, then we encrypt the email. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, Patrick uh, hit on the fact, you know, SMIME has gotten a lot easier. SMIME is predominantly what we use. And we actually do all of that key management for our customers. So they don't have to have to deal with that. A lot of our customers are small businesses that, you know, terms like PKI are just like, you know, 
blow their mind. Right, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so we do all the key management for our customers and we automatically encrypt all of the emails between our customers because we have their keys. Mm -hmm. And um, our kind of focus in email encryption because it's always been kind of one of these things that's difficult is we do everything we can to make it easy. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. And so even if you're not a customer, if you received an, receive an encrypted email from us, what we do is put it into a, a secure email portal that looks like your standard web-based email, mm -hmm. right? So somebody getting that is going to go, oh, this is kind of like Gmail. Let me just kind of, you know, do my thing here. Um, and, and that's hugely important when you're trying to get users to, you know, make sure they're securing that email communication is that you make it as, as easy as possible. Um, so, so yeah, that's what we do and, and uh, have done that for, uh, gosh, uh, let me see, since 1999. So oh, wow. we've been doing it for a long time. <laughs> that's good. I know that as a user outside of Tech on Purpose and being an MSP that I've noticed some emails coming through as like data encrypted, but I haven't had to do anything. Nothing has been different for me. Yeah. So that's really important because I need it easy. I need it simple. I need it broken down for me. Yeah. So yeah. And we actually call it, which kind of sounds like a bad term. We call that transparent email encryption yeah. because we actually encrypt it after the user's hit send. And then we decrypt it before it lands in the recipient's inbox. So right. it's encrypted over the internet. But sender and recipient are like, well, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> right. And that's important, right? Because yeah. some of these cybersecurity topics are so complex and the everyday person or someone like me that knows very little, it's important yeah. that it's super simple. It's automated and we don't need to do anything, but it is still cybersecurity. It is still safe. So yes. I think that's like one of the most important approaches to cybersecurity. Thanks, Dina. Patrick, over to you. What is Global Sign's approach? Global Sign is a certificate authority. So we are one of the trusted entities that the web has given uh, the permissions to issue trusted certificates for a range of different use cases, like we discussed before, whether that's email certificates, uh, SSL certificates for securing web traffic, um, you know, we issue client certificates, we issue IoT certificates, uh, a whole range of different trusted certificate types that you can use to secure various endpoints. Um, you know, one of the things that we are most focused on, um, you know, that we're most known for, I guess, would be uh, SSL TLS certificates. And, uh, you know, that's because that's probably been one of the most public types of digital certificates, owing largely to Google's push to encrypt the entire web and require every website to have an SSL certificate. Um, and I think that maybe it would be good to kind of, maybe we've done this in an earlier episode, sort of zoom out on why that's so important. And it's not just for web connections, it's for anything on the internet. It's not an A to B connection when you're sending something online. It doesn't just go from your endpoint to their endpoint. It bounces and, and, and goes through a whole bunch of different endpoints on its way to its destination. And you can't possibly trust that each one of those endpoints is secure and that nobody's eavesdropping on it, that nobody's capable of looking at what you're doing. So when you encrypt data along that, that route, it helps to ensure not only that the data stays secure and isn't stolen, but as was uh, mentioned earlier, that it stays authentic, that, you know, that it's what was intended to be sent, that it can't be manipulated or tampered with or anything like that. And that's important across so many different uh, touch points on the internet, not just web connections. So it's really important uh, that you understand what it is you're doing to secure that. And, you know, with certificates, you can do so much of that, at least securing the data in transit, not so much the data at rest. So that's really what Global Sign does is as a certificate authority, you know, we help organizations, large and small, to secure their endpoints and then to manage it all and automate the portions that they want to so that it doesn't become a burden for them and so that it is easy. And that's you know one of the first things about PKI is it's not right. naturally easy. It's something that you know you need a trusted partner to really help you know guide you through this because as right. Dina said, you know, PKI makes a lot of people's minds blow up. That's not a term that's widely known. So you know, when you have a trusted partner that can help you with those decisions and to a larger extent, even with the crypto agility, with the incoming uh, 
threat of quantum computing and understanding what crypto systems and algorithms you should be using and you know how to best position yourself for that. There's a lot of different things that you need to focus on with regard to what we do. And you know, being a trusted partner is really the biggest part of uh, our strategy is you need somebody like that. Yeah, absolutely. And approach that I like to take to this topic or actually any of our cybersecurity topics is the KISS approach, which is keep it simple, stupid, right? <laughs> the, like, it's obvious out there, like our, well, besides you guys, most people out there like don't know what we're talking about, right? And so it's really important to keep it super simple, keep it automated, keep it easy for everyone to understand and implement, you know, because then that they're going to do it. Right. If there's too much to learn, they're just it's gonna fall by the wayside. Ah, I couldn't agree more. So, Jeremy, what solutions do or actually what solutions does CyberTrust have for data encryption? Good question. So we are basically a, a GCR organization, products and services centered around governance, compliance, and risk, right? So while we don't have encryption solutions per se, we offer services that help an organization focus on where they require those governance or compliance or risk assessment situations. And, and one of the ways we find that organizations repeatedly fall short and need some help or some guidance in is identifying the valuable data in their organization or the sensitive data in their organization. Some of them might have an idea, oh yeah, I know I have an EMR, uh, mm -hmm. a full of patient health information. Well, that's great, but where else are you sending that patient health information? Are you using your scanners to email content from paper into your EMR? And if you are, you need to be concerned about the encryption from that scanner and that email functionality, mm -hmm. right? So we, we, we focus not only on the risk assessment and compliance and governance facet of it, but also the discovery process of helping organizations to become aware of where their data lies and where it needs to be protected. One of the areas that uh, I've been emphasizing most recently that a lot of organizations have, have, have forgotten about protecting are their backups, right? Yeah. So you look at a, a world where as an industry, we've moved away from the old tape backups, but tape backups were awesome for one very specific reason. We had an offline copy of our backups mm -hmm. that couldn't be destroyed by attackers, right. that couldn't be erased by ransomware, that we could restore to reliably within reason. Of course, tapes right. had their issues. Magnetic media has its shortcomings and its own reliability challenges. Uh, but in a world where online replication has become the cost-effective solution for our backups, I've, I've been educating organizations on utilizing either encryption or other solutions mm -hmm. to protect their backups to help to deflate some of the power that the ransomware threat actors have over our organizations by, by protecting their backups the same way they protect their critical data. Um, you see that in a lot of different solutions that are out there. Uh, some immutable S3 buckets are a great example. Of course, the old read once, write many, or write once, read many solutions of tape backups, uh, or just plain old fashioned uh, encrypted digit physical storage that you air gap or unplug to uh, protect it. Before I close out today, Jay, what are your final thoughts on this topic? Actually, it doesn't feel like we've made this easy yet. <laughs> Seems easy right? to me, so maybe I'm because, learning something. Because history. it's it, we we can't forget that it's not easy. And, and, and Patrick, I'm going to call on you to kind of help help guide this next section because I've got a question for you that I think would provide value for everybody else that might help make it easy. You know, Jeremy talked earlier about you know, non repudiation, authentication of of one side and the other in the conversation. When a certificate is issued, like when you, when a company comes to you and says, "Hey, I need to put a SSL certificate on my website," right? That, that you've got to authenticate who that company is. What are some of the things that you guys look for to verify that they really are that company, that they're really Coca Cola or Pepsi or whoever, mm -hmm. and they're not some hacker trying to get a certificate so they yeah. can impersonate? So, what what does that look like? Because I think that that's interesting stuff mm -hmm. that, that the audience might like. That, that, that is a really good question. And that kind of goes to a larger conversation that we've been having kind of as an industry about the level of validation that should be required for a web server certificate. Um, because at the, at the bottom, the, the basic most, you know, low level of validation is just simple domain validation, you know, where you're just ensuring that the, the host name matches what they're, they're, they're trying to request. And then you can get a certificate. You can get a free SSL certificate with very little validation. If you want to actually prove that you're an organization 
there are two higher levels of validation, organization validation and extended validation. Extended validation used to have its own little perk. It would put the validated, the authenticated name of the organization in the address bar of a web browser. Um, I think that largely people use their phones now more than computers for a lot of the browsing, and there was difficulty in displaying it that way. And I think there were some other actors that questioned the value of that level of validation anyway and just wanted to get a certificate on every server, regardless of, you know, try to make as few hoops as possible to jump through. But with organization validation and extended validation, um, we do actually have to look for proof that that business has a legal registration in the area that it's it's claiming to be in, that it has business phones, that it has, you know, certain proof that it is actually a business that it does operate in that area. Um, there's a number of actual checks that are prescribed through the CAB Forum's baseline requirements that our vetting, pro our vetting department has to go through in order to understand who the organization is. Um, and once they have satisfied all of those checks, um, and you know those are constantly being tweaked by the CAB Forum, which is kind of the governing body for SSL and publicly trusted digital certificates. Um, once those are satisfied, then that certificate can be issued. And when you review the certificate, and this is another problem is a lot of consumers and web users don't understand how to look at a website certificate, it will show that verified information about the company that's operating the website. Um, if it uses a higher level of validation with its web certificate. But right now with the domain validating certificates, you can really get a certificate from anywhere. And I mean, I, I, not to speak ill because it's a great service, but that is one of the things that they say is that, well, the criminals use Let's Encrypt because you can just get a certificate with a web name and go. It's, it's clear as mud, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't think that that did much to clarify. I apologize, but it is a <laughs> No, but, but Patrick, it does because it starts to helps people understand that what's really happening is is that you're you're standing behind who you're issuing a certificate to at different levels. I get it, but so that yes. that, that there's confidence that if I see a certificate assigned to a business, that it, it, there's a high probability that that's correct. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean there's not not uh, malicious actors out there that are going to find ways around it and use use other techniques to bypass, you know, encryption keys and that certificate management, but it makes it much more difficult right. when a user can point and click and see who authenticated it when, and is this a trusted company that issues certificates, you know, and, and is, is authenticated as such, right? So it's it never stops the authentication process. So it's, it's good to know that, that, that behind the scenes, there's a lot of really, really smart people making this possible. Mm -hmm. you know, our team here at ConnectWise, you know, works with partners so that they learn how to implement security and how to think about it. Um, and encryption is one of the areas that, that we teach on, but we don't deliver a product. So I'm not here to say, mm -hmm. hey, use us as much as, you know, start talking to your tech on purpose. Talk to your, your, your IT professionals about where security fits in their business and where encryption fits. Because Jeremy hit it earlier, that those safe harbor laws, the, the, those rules that say, hey, if you can prove the laptop that was stolen out of your car, you know, was encrypted, mm -hmm. I don't have to report that breach. Mm -hmm. And that's a really big deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. and, and, and that's just a small sample of how many different times and ways it happens. So again, encrypt, 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 and make sure you're talking to your teams about data right. at rest, data in motion, and data in processing, which is like when firewalls open up Mm -hmm. you know, to look at look and see if there's anything malicious inside of them and put them back together again. So a lot, a lot of areas where you can focus as a business owner to get your teams giving you the right answers. Right. And like I said in the intro, encrypt all data all the time, right? So Dina and Jeremy, before I close this out, do you guys have any final comments on the encryption? Well, one thing just real quick that I hope people also have picked up on is find a good partner. Somebody that already knows more about this than you do. It's not, you know, companies or and people in IT can't be experts on everything. So it's it's really important you find those organizations that you can partner with that really can help you figure out what you need to do. Um, and and there's yeah, a lot of good companies out there to talk to. Jeremy, any final words? 
you know, Dina hit the nail on the head, took the words right out of my mouth, right? And in, in, in summarizing what, what Jay was trying to drive home and, and how do we simplify this for, for organizations to understand, it really comes down to there are plenty of pitfalls in encryption, plenty of details, plenty of pure topics and categories, right? When you look at our, our panelists here today, whether it's endpoint, email, SSL certificates or authentication certificates or other forms of certificates, there's so many different individual specialities within the encryption domain um, that an organization really should pursue the assistance of a trusted vendor, trusted partner like Tech on Purpose or otherwise to help bring the right solutions for that business's needs. An important takeaway from today is that when the other lines of your cybersecurity defenses fall short and your data is compromised, Encryption can help to mitigate the risk from bad actors who lack the tools or even encryption keys, right, hopefully, needed to unleash the havoc that they intend. But join us next week as we dive into mobile device management. Working remotely has become more essential and is most likely here to stay. Mobile devices have become an integral part of most organizations. It's a vital tool for product Activity and efficiency, but how can you safeguard them from attack? Catch up on all episodes on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, or Spotify, and get delivery straight to your inbox by signing up at techonpurpose.net slash blog. And if you would like to start a free trial from our solution partners today, send us an email at free trial at who's in your dot cloud. And while you're over there, sign up for our free cybersecurity risk assessment at who's in your dot cloud. Well, that is all from us today. I appreciate all of you joining us and we will see you next week. Bye everybody.